Modern Money Primer Blog Number 6 Responses Note to Commentators We've got a techie problem, so my response did not get up last night, and we have been unable to post it so far today. Should be up later today. Meanwhile, I will paste it in here, but be assured, it will be properly formatted and posted later. Thanks for comments. As you may have noticed, I kept the blog shorter this week so that we could focus on a smaller range of topics. That seems to have helped. The comments this week are also well focused. I think I can hit the main concerns by addressing three topics. Due to space limitations, these will be in the next three comments. Number one. Relation between the sovereign currency and the medium of exchange. We first introduced the money of account, the dollar in the US and the pound in the UK. This is a unit of account, a measuring unit, like, an, like the inch, foot, and yard. It does not exist even as an electronic entry. Not even a bloodhound could sniff it out. It is a representational something only a human could imagine. Next, we introduced the concept of money things, denominated in the money of account. Similarly, our unit used to measure length cannot be sniffed by a dog, but it does have physical things that can be sniffed and measured. The inchworm is an inch in length. My foot is a foot, more or less. And the football field is a hundred times the distance from Henry the First's nose to thumb. Probably more, actually, as we know those kings exaggerated the size of their anatomical features like rap stars today. This can, be, this can include paper, notes, and electronic entries. We'll say a lot more about the nature of those things that get measured by the money of account. This week, we introduce the sovereign currency, the national money of account adopted by a sovereign government. While a money of account could, in theory, be created and adopted by private entities, the sovereign currency is adopted by the sovereign government. And the sovereign currency is usually, at least, the primary money of account, if not the only money of account, used within a sovereign nation. The word currency is frequently used to designate not only the money of account adopted by sovereign government, but also to designate a money thing issued by the sovereign government and denominated in the money of account. In the U.S., it is the coin issued by the Treasury and the note issued by the Fed. In other words, we use the term dollar to indicate both the sovereign currency, money of account, and the money thing, paper note or coin, issued by the U.S. government. We, ha we have not yet got to the medium of exchange. Most textbooks begin with the medium of exchange. Crusoe and Friday look about for handy seashells to function as convenient media of exchange. I reject that story and purposely wait to introduce the concept. But to jump a bit ahead, yes, the money thing, currency issued by government generally functions as a medium of exchange. Other privately issued money things also frequently function as media of exchange. That is a function of money things and really does not help us to understand much about the nature of money. When you walk into a relatively new diner or any other mom and pop firm, there usually is a frame hanging on the wall with a dollar bill and some sort of statement like, the first dollar we ever earned. Here, money functions as a memento, reflecting the pride of the owner of the establishment. Two decades ago, there were lots of stories of Wall Street traders using $100 bills functioning as cocaine delivery devices. I don't think it is useful to put undue emphasis on the various functions of money. Let us at least first try to understand its nature. Number two, 
That leads us to the question about bank money. Again, we will get into this in detail coming in coming weeks. However, to break the suspense, banks and other institutions as well as individuals can issue IOUs denominated in the money of account. We do not call these currency. They are not issued by sovereign government. They are money things, yes. Some are more special than others. The IOU of the Bank of America, a private bank, not Uncle Sam's bank, is more special than the IOU that you issue. Yes, it can function as a medium of exchange. The reasons for the specialness will be examined later. But an obvious one is that to some degree, Uncle Sam stands behind Bank of America. For example, he guarantees demand deposits, your checking account. So, yes, I do understand the worry that Uncle Sam has essentially licensed Bank of America to counterfeit dollars. If the bank goes bust, Uncle Sam will pay out nice new dollar bills to depositors. This raises many issues of concern, and some of those are directly relevant to the global financial crisis we are going through, in which Uncle Sam has effectively done just that. But for right now, that really would take us too far afield. Please, be patient. Number three, currencies and balances. Recall that we have discussed briefly unsold inventories. Suppose it is in the end of the year 1974 and we are Ford Motor Company and we produced 1,000 Ford Pintos. Remember those, the ones with the exploding gas tanks? that we cannot sell. Unsold inventory gets counted as investment. Ford carries the inventory at its market price. Let us say the average price of the Pintos that it did actually did sell in 1974. Assume it cannot sell them in 1975, either deep recession, bad publicity about the tanks, and so on. How to value them? All things equal, Ford would prefer not to book a loss of value. It carries them at original value. Otherwise, the value of its inventory declines, impacting 1975 profits and net worth. Now, in 2011, it is still carrying those pin pintos in inventory. You see the problem? We have to assign a dollar value to them. Now, let's address the problem of dual currencies. Suppose Ford produces cars in America, but sells them in America and Japan. It imports all the electronic components from Japan. It can keep two sets of books, one for dollars and one for yen. It has income and outgo in each currency. Clearly, it could run a deficit in one and a surplus in the other, or surpluses in both, or deficits in both, etc. You get the picture. All other firms, households, and levels of government can do the same in dollars and yen. Adding up all the sectors, we get to our three balances in each of the currencies. But Ford's shareholders do not want to know that there is a surplus, that it has a surplus in dollars of one billion and a deficit in yen of one trillion. It wants the overall balance for Ford's income. Just as, just as we have to convert pintos to dollars, we have to convert those yen to dollars. We need an exchange rate. Yen and dollars float, changing every day in relative value. It is going to make a huge difference what, ex what exchange rate we use. So, yes, I am sympathetic to Tobinesque's comments. The cleanest way is to keep the accounts separate, and there will be sectoral balances in each currency that do not balance. But, yes, a government as well as a firm needs a budget in one currency. Generally, it is going to be, it is going to be the domestic currency. And so if income and outgo occur in more than one, exchange rates 
must be used to get everything into that currency of denomination. This is true even if the government firm household actually has bank accounts denominated in the foreign cur currency. This complicates matters because now the sectoral balances will not balance exactly unless everyone uses the same exchange rate all the time, which would happen if we peg. This issue has come up before. There are variations in estimates of the three balances. One reader pointed out that one of the graphs I used showing, say, the private deficit during the Clinton years differed a bit from a later one I showed here on the money, Modern Money Primer. The reason was due to updated data in different sources. The older one came from Wint Godley and the later one from Scott Fulweiler. As they say, economics is not an exact science. More seriously, you should not think that aggregate economic data like GDP or the CPI, Consumer Price Index, or the sectoral balance are measured precisely. These are estimates using data that is constructed. What is important is consistency. I know this always shocks students the first time they hear it, but the CPI does not come from heaven. It is constructed, it is revised, and it is subject to great debate among wonky people with thick glasses. And believe it or not, it does matter exactly how these data are constructed. But do not get misled by that. Certainly, at the level of logic, the three balances do balance. If we could measure things exactly, they would balance in practice. Knowing that they should balance, the statistician who puts them together ensures they do balance by construction. This is not easy. A statistical discrepancy is added to ensure they do, and if you need a big one of those, that is not good. And yes, dealing with devaluing those inventories is a big headache. I can, rem I can remember when Wint Godley used to fret over that, and I didn't understand why. Now, I do.